we'll go ahead and get started so that I can turn the stage over to our panel. Um, so for folks who don't know me, uh, my name is Brian Solom. Uh, I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm the Director of Communications for Slow Food USA. Uh, I am based in the unceded homelands of the Ojibwa, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations in Chicago. Um, I'd love to learn where you're from too, so please drop that in the chat. Um, for people in the room who aren't familiar, Slow Food USA is a food justice organization that strives to create a world where all people can eat food that is good for them, good for the people who grow it, and good for the planet. We cultivate nationwide programs and a network of more than 80 local chapters. We host educational events and advocacy campaigns, and we build solidarity through partnerships. Uh, together, we are dismantling oppressive food systems to achieve good, clean, and fair food for all. Uh, we're also part of a global million person movement that's about to have a gathering later this month in Italy um, because it's gonna take every one of us on this entire planet to combat climate injustice, food injustice, uh, racial injustice, and so many more oppressive forces in our world. Uh, you can learn more about what we're doing at slowfoodusa.org. Uh, we're also a membership-based organization. So to fuel events like what you're about to experience, uh, we really rely on our 3000 members. Um, and the small contributions that they're able to make. So uh, consider joining as a member of Slow Food USA. Now let's focus on today's Slow Food Live event. Uh, I'm so excited for what I'm about to learn and experience uh, from our moderator, Denisa Livingston, as well as Daniel Antelope and Shannon Reyna. So I'm gonna turn the stage over to Denisa Livingston to introduce herself and to kick our conversation off. Hi everyone, welcome. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, um she ate Denisa Livingston and Nishia Kit the Cheatney Nishland to shit the net at Bush's chain. Ose Dana at Tachitney, Dashache, Do Nanish Eja Tachi Nash Dashanella, I see that Nasha A Tedagon will yet the Ogut Ah Dianishila. Just introduce myself in my Dine language. I'm from the Red House People Clan. I grew up just behind this pinnacle, um, the famous um, Shiprock Pinnacle in a place called Mitten Rock. And so I'm here on Dinetka um, in the New Mexico area of the Navajo Nation. And just welcome everyone. Um, hopefully you're doing well. And we're just really excited for today's conversation and really looking at the, the challenges and opportunities of Native nutrition, especially during the time that we are in this pandemic. And just a little bit about myself, um, I just recently concluded my role um, five years as the Slow Food International Indigenous Council of the Global North, and I'm also um, leading um, locally here, Diné Community Advocacy Alliance for almost a decade now. We're known for um, some of the tax and food laws that we have um, innovatively uh, presented and created, but also implemented. And so um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm also um, in law school studying Indigenous Peoples Law. And so just really excited about all of the intersectionalities when we talk about our land, talk about water, talk about food sovereignty, and also reclaiming our rights and also also exploring um, strategies and healing frameworks to be able to implement um, the solutions that we need in our communities, especially during this time of climate chaos. And so um, thank you to Slow Food um, USA, um, to Brian, to Anna, Mara, um, to Ian, um, who had attended um, our Native Nutrition Conference uh, at Shakopee um, back in May. And so it's been really exciting to actually transition into the setting and to continue, continue the conversation about the importance of um, food sovereignty, but also food traditionalism and also the innovative ways um, our two sisters here will be sharing. And so just um, a background of what we're doing, what we've been um, um, representing, but also what we've been advocating about. And my final um, um, ask, but also uh, announcement in case you haven't heard. Um, we've been doing this Let's Eat In campaign, Let's Eat Indigenous. Um, and so it's something that we have been raising awareness about. We have held um, challenges, 10 day challenges to let's uh, cut the crap, CRAP, carbonated refined artificial processed foods, cutting that from our diet for 10 days. And we decided to switch it up after almost a decade of doing that um, in Zumba events together and, and community 
communicating, you know, what health is and helping our tribal leaders to understand, you know, the dynamics of health, but also the fun part of health. And so we have this Let's Eat in campaign from DCAA and um, Let's Eat Indigenous is really um, raising awareness about the nutritional trauma that we've been facing, um, all of the unhealthy food that um, is unregulated in our nations and our communities, um, in our territories, but also just raising awareness about the local foods, about the local growers, about the lo local produce, the wild foods, um, the foods that um, are available um, around us, but also our own traditional heirloom foods. And so the conversation is based um, around this and um, get your t-shirts, go to our website, um, wear it at Terra Madre next month um, coming up um, in a couple of weeks. And um, yeah, we, we're looking forward to seeing all of you that are going there and also today joining us. Um, thank you for just taking the time out. And so my two sisters here, very dynamic uh, women, and uh, thanks to Ian McFall for following up and saying, you know, let's get these, you know, uh, two sisters in the conversation. And so um, shout out to you, Ian. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and start off with um, Danielle um, Antelope. Um, she was one of our panelists at the Native Nutrition Conference and um, has been really engaged in advocacy, but also just exploring strategies, solutions, um, implementing um, traditional food, traditional values, traditional culture. She made us all cry at the at the conference because it's just really heartfelt. It's there's a lot of spiritual work um, her and, and Shannon Ray, Reyna are doing. And so it's just not something that, you know, it's it's a job or an occupation. It's something that has been passed down through generations, but also just knowing like we have this responsibility. And so um, we'd like to hear from Danielle. And she is actually um, one of our youth that, you know, we look up to look, look forward to hearing from her. She's um, from the Blackfeet Nation and Easter Shoshone Nation. And um, she was born in Browning, Montana, and also graduated from Montana, Montana State University with a bachelor's degree in sustainable food and bioenergy systems. And so I'm going to only share that much. Um, she's going to tell us about her work, introduce herself, and uh, if you have any questions, please put that in the chat um, as she goes along, and we'll put some links in there, and then we'll move on to our, our sister from the Southwest, um, Shannon, after that. Okay, over to you, uh, popcorn it to you, Danielle. Thank you so much, Denisa. Okay, Nestu, Estansky, Nadangu, Danielle Antelope. Hello, my name is Comes in Singing. I am called Danielle Antelope. I am from Browning, Montana, at the foot of the Rockies, and I am Amskapi Pikani, which was misnamed Blackfeet. Today, I am going to share um, some of the work that I do at Fast Blackfeet, but I also want to talk about um, how we got to the work. Why is the work essential? Why do, um, what's the purpose for it? And so, um, Fast Blackfeet is a nonprofit organization, um, and we fill, we identify and fill gaps within food insecurity, nutrition education, and food sovereignty, because those three things are very related. We cannot have food sovereignty if we don't have the other two. Um, what we do uh, at Fast Blackfeet really comes from the history of what happened to the food system, and we really focus ours on the Blackfeet food system, but it's relevant across the board uh, on all land spaces. And that really has to, goes back to what our traditional diet was. Um, sometimes I really like the new term of ancestral foods uh, rather than traditional diet because traditional foods in the term gets misconstrued, right? Sometimes when we say traditional foods, people think fry bread and that's not traditional food. And so in, my, in our community, what we do is first teach about the food system. Uh, to, because I didn't know that information. So we, we go with this model of not assuming that anybody knows any particular information. So we share it like it's brand new every time. Um, and in the Blackfeet food system, our traditional foods consist of bison, buffalo, wild game, and over 200 plants that are used for food and medicine. And we had a large um, traditional territory to be able to to get those foods and the physical movement and the spiritual connection with harvesting and um, being connected to those to the foods that you provide. And they're also very nutrient dense foods. Um, 
I always, <laughs> I like to tell people that we were the original bougie eaters, right? When Buffalo burgers are like in style right now where the, everybody, <laughs> everybody's eating land-based diets, but those are indigenous uh, food ways. And I think that's important to put that power into native people's hands again and tell them the history of it and tell them um, the foods that are originally made for their bodies. Um, and then talking about how uh, reservations and the foods that became rations play into the food system, right? Uh, the, the force to reservations and then the agreement that new foods would come uh, now that the buffalo were disappearing uh, with the hunt across the nation and how tragic that was for all food systems. When, when tribes started to starve, they started to comply, right? And um, for the survival of their tribe, um, and when that happened for our tribe, we were introduced, like all native people, introduced to these new foods such as flour, beef, sugar, oil, um, all of these foods that were, that were not as nutrient dense as the foods that we were used to from the land. And that really plays in and starts trickling into the statistics of the health diseases that we have in Indian country. Um, and, and I always, huh, Linda Black commented, oh my gosh, okay. Anyways, um, I, I really like to talk about um, how, though, how the shift of the food system reflects in our health of our people today. And talking about the food system could rather get people really pumped or really mad. Um, and that's both of those are energy, right? It's bringing new knowledge to people and they're feeling something with that knowledge. And I really like that um, people start to relate it to their own families. They start thinking about their great grandmother in that time and not thinking of it as like something in the past that's ancient, that doesn't matter anymore, but something that trickled into where we are today, why our, where our health is in our families. Um, after rations uh, and the new commodity system, um, we then had a generation that only knew survival foods. Um, we went from great grandmother's generation of knowing traditional foods and how to prepare um, organ meats and how to prepare dry meat. And then having this new generation, which would be my mom's generation, my aunts and my uncles, um, growing up with all of these survival foods, um, foods that such as fry bread that became a, in existence due to um, survival. And so in our community, we say traditional foods and survival foods. And then we help people categorize those. Is berries traditional foods or survival foods? Same thing with fry bread. And then um, being able to have more uh, connection and, and relate to those traditional foods from our land. Um, and it gives people more power, right? If you wanna be a little bit rebellious to the system, um, eat indigenous foods. Um, what we do at Fast Blackfeet once we recognize that there was these gaps in food insecurity and nutrition education and how to, how to make those opportunities available, we became a nonprofit and applied for a lot of grants and a lot of private donations. Um, and then we were able to start programs. And today we have three programs. We have a need-based food pantry. We have a nutrition education program and a growing health program that's focused on garden and harvesting projects. Um, within those programs, we teach the difference between traditional foods and survival foods and by providing access, right? We can't just teach people about it. The history it can't just be words. Words have power, but so do opportunities. And so what we do is we provide these different opportunities in our community to, re to connect with those foods. Um, in our food pantry, we provide uh, healthy foods, local foods, and culturally relevant foods. Right now we have two big freezers full of buffalo meat um, that come from a donation of a local rancher in Montana. And so uh, we're able to provide that access, but also recipes, right? People are not gonna choose a food just because we said it's better for them. Just because we said this is a black feet food, they still don't have that connection of how to cook that food. So what we do at Fast Black Feet is we, we, under, we understand that not everybody has all the knowledge. And so not even, not even us, that's why we go to these great conferences and learn from you all. Um, we, we share recipes. Recipe sharing is a big part of what we do. Um, we have a lot of our community members who are into this buffalo berry chili that we have um, been sharing. And 
along with recipe sharing, if that goes into the food pantry area, right? Um, when we're giving out buffalo meat or root vegetables or traditional teas, we also need to teach people how to, how to consume loose leaf tea, how to cook these different parts of the buffalo, how to make bone broth with the bones, um, and being able to provide those uh, opportunities of how to do it and learning together. And, and we do that through cooking classes as well. We have cooking class series and they have um, local, they rather feature a local food or a, a culturally relevant food, a Blackfeet food. And then it makes people more excited. It's like, oh, this next cooking class, we're gonna cook with organs, how crazy. Um, but then really being empow empowered and learning about what's the nutrients in each one of these foods. Why is bone broth healthy? Um, and, and being able to bring nutrition education and culturally relevant information together to make indigenous people wanna learn it and, and wanna be intrigued and wanna be able to teach it to other people. Um, even if it takes this long to talk about the whole food um, system to why they're so pumped about this cooking class. Um, we also have medical nutrition therapy with our dietitian here at Fast Blackfeet. Um, so that we provide opportunities for those who are diabetic or um, ha have dialysis to be able to um, meet with our dietitian and get a specialized food box from the food pantry that is for their specific um, food needs. And so it's through our programs, we in all three of our programs, we provide access and opportunity to these traditional foods. Oh, sorry guys. That's my alarm to know when to start wrapping it up <laughs> or I'll just keep talking. <laughs> um, and so uh, today I just wanted to be able to share um, what the history is of why we're having this conversation today. Why are we talking about indigenous eating and, um, and, and how, it's, how it's the future, right? I always tell people, especially with the degree that I went into, that the food system's future is indigenous. And that's why these conversations are so important and all of the efforts that we're doing individually are so important because we're constantly learning from each other and the rest of the world is also going to learn from us. So thank you so much for this opportunity to share some of the work that we're doing at Fast Black Feet. And I also just want to give a shout out to Indian Collective. Um, I couldn't be in this position as executive director without um, the funding through um, the Changemaker Fellowship. So I'm very grateful to be part of that fellowship. We have fellows um, from all over Turtle Island and um, I've never felt such an inclusive space. And, uh, and it's so powerful to have organizations that um, invest in, in the leader um, instead of in the organization or instead of in different things. So it, thank you so much um, if we have anybody from Indian Collective on today. Danielle, that was just a quick 10 minutes and a quick intro to the great work. Um, I hope, you know, we have continued conversations to hear from her, to learn from her, but also just introducing everyone to Danielle and the work that they're doing, um, but also the important uh, work that is supported by Indian Collective. We're really happy and excited for you to be a part of that fellowship and also just looking forward to the work and going forward and, and, and how you're training, providing knowledge and information, exploring ways to help people to reclaim our taste, education, education, our, our taste buds, reprogram our taste buds for liberation, um, but also knowing, you know, we're still tied to the salt, sugar, and flour um, for generations, and how do we undo that? How do we reprogram? How do we unprogram? How do we reintroduce? Um, but also, like you said, you know, to continue to be the bougie eaters, like you said, um, in eating more traditional foods and indigenous foods. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, and we'll come back um, after Shannon um, presents um, in this next a uh, couple of minutes. So let's go ahead and move on um, to our sister Shannon Reyna, um, who is here in the Southwest as well. Um, our sister here is an enrolled member of the Salt River Pima uh, Maricopa Indian community. And so she has been leading um, school food service um, for quite some time. And we're just really excited to hear more about the work that she's done and also just the innovation and the strategies that she's implementing into the schools, the recipes, 
like Danielle had mentioned, we need to collect these and share this amongst each other. Um, you can find some um, articles, some YouTube videos um, that she has been interviewed and featured in. And so really excited um, to hear and, and hopefully you'll mention um, the Bob um, bowls that, that are just like delicious and yummy um, and, and hope everyone will be able to make some of that. Um, if you can mention that, uh, the story about that, it's, it's really important for us to share and to know. And thank you for um, being here, Shannon, over to you, sister. Thank you. It's good tosh, everybody. On up to gig, Shannon Reyna. On autumn pipash, chujukum. Up amjet, on akmel. On at food service manager, Salt River Schools. On vas up to gig, Edward Bedreno, Reyna. Senior bot on un gaga up chugig Jeanette Vivian French bot on adopted baba up chugig Dixon Harold Andreas bot on little up chugig Hazel Laverne Adzuo bot on first baba up chugig Juan Asa Eschief Jr. bot on Og up chugig Edward Reina Jr. on Jua up chugig Annette Rave. What I just shared with you is the proper way to introduce yourself in autumn. Taught to me by my mom and my grandpa Dixon. In English, I said, my name is Shannon Reyna. I am Pima Maricopa and Mexican. I am from Salt River. I am the food service manager for Salt River Schools. My paternal grandfather was Edward Medueno Reyna Sr. My paternal grandma was Jeanette Vivian French. My maternal adopted grandpa was Dixon Harold Andreas. My maternal grandma was Hazel Laverne Azul. My biological grandpa was Juan Asa Eschief Jr. My dad is Annette Reina, Annette Re, Edward Reina Jr. And my mom is Annette Rave. I would like to show how honored I am to be here. I work in a kitchen, so normally I wear the food service uniform of black pants, polo shirt, and non-slip shoes. Today, I wanted to wear something special something that reminds me of who I am and why I am here today. I know you can't see me, but today I am wearing my traditional autumn dress, a beaded shell necklace and bare feet. As I was deciding which dress to wear this morning, I said to myself, why bother? No one's gonna see me. But I took a few seconds and decided it did not matter who saw my dress. I was going to wear it because it gives me confidence. Confidence in who I am as a native woman, a caregiver, to my family and my community. I am a native woman. I am Autumn and Pipash and have only recently embraced the importance of that sense. I have always been a caregiver. Being the oldest child, I was responsible for my younger siblings and part of that responsibility was to feed them dinner every day after school. So I learned to cook. Cooking became an important part of who I am today. It is what inspired me to begin my career in school nutrition. In 2008, I was hired as a part-time cook aide with Salt River. And even though I knew how to cook, I realized I knew very little about good nutrition. As I advanced in my career, I learned more about nutrition and how it affects the body. As many other native persons, I grew up eating commodity foods, canned meat, processed cheese, and white flour. It is only now after much research that I realize how bad those foods are for native people. For the autumn and peeposh, Specifically, our bodies are store, our bodies store fat to be able to survive on very little. Eating processed and high fat foods is not good for us. This combined with very little physical activity is what makes us vulnerable to type two diabetes. Diabetes is killing us. Poor nutrition is killing us. It's time to change. We need to learn more about our traditional foods, how to plant, grow and prepare them. Traditional foods are an important part of our history. They carry not only nutrition that is beneficial to our physical bodies, but stories of survival and resilience, stories that are beneficial to our spirits and pertinent to healing from many things, even in my opinion, historical trauma. And speaking with my Jua, my mom, the other day I asked a question about traditional foods and she brought up an important point. Traditional foods take time to prepare. For instance, a pot of tepary beans takes all day to cook. Good food can't be rushed, she said. And that is what holds people back. We want things fast. She mentioned how you can taste the difference in a pot of beans that has been cooked all day and, a, and beans that have been fast boiled. 
one of my favorite quotes is food is love. And this is very fitting when it comes to the prep preparation of traditional foods. This brings me to my why. Why am I so passionate about using traditional foods on our school menus? Because I care. As I mentioned earlier, I am a caregiver. I want our children to have a chance to live long, healthy lives, to be successful in whatever they choose to do. To move past this continuing cycle of bad nutrition, bad health and endless suffering. I am tired of watching my family, my community suffer. We deserve better. The best place to develop changes with the young. If we can educate, inspire, and lead the children down a healthier path, we will all be the better for it. I know my vision might not be the easiest way to go. Like my mom said, good food takes time. Cooking tepary beans overnight for 300 children is definitely a labor of love. But aren't we worth it? Aren't they worth it? As Native people, we have been accustomed to settling for whatever we get. And I want our children to know they deserve the best. They deserve to learn how our ancestors lived and survived so they too can hold their head up high and proudly say, I am a native person. I am Atam and Piposh. In closing, I just wanna share that Salt River will continue to develop recipes, support ADE and the farm to school movement. We, we do our best to support support like local native farms um, and I just want to mention um, since Denisa brought it up our swan bob bowl which um, is a recipe that is near and dear to my heart because um, it was developed by myself and my sister who is a was an Ironman triathlete and uh, she helped me to develop that recipe when we found out that Ironman Tri the Ironman triathletes were going to be here in Salt River schools because they ride through, they do the bike portion through Salt River. And so we wanted to um, provide them a meal, but also incorporate some of our indigenous foods in that meal uh, and make it extra special for them. So talking with her and she said, they eat high carbs. So we developed the swan bob bowl, which is brown rice, the tepary bean, and um, seasoned chicken. And then it's topped with the homemade salsa, fresh lettuce. It is very delicious. And every time we serve it here in Salt River schools, it, you know, everybody loves it. Um, and just to put a little um, brag out there, we, it is one of four recipes that are being looked at um, that are hopefully going to make it in the USDA standardized recipe book. So we're really excited about that. Um, as a lunch lady, it's um, quite an accomplishment to have a recipe in the USDA book. So Daihu Gai, thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Um, you're making us all hungry. And if <laughs> those of you that um, still want to see the YouTube video, um, she's talking about this with one of the chefs. Um, talking about the bowl and, and also how to make it. Um, it is really nutritious. Um, just a question um, for you both, um, for those that are not familiar with the foods in your area, um, please share with us, um, Danielle and, and Shannon, um, what foods are in your area, what you like to cook, um, and also maybe what mom or grandma, grandpa have taught you to cook um, and help us to learn you know, more about the ecosystem where you're at. Uh, here in Salt River, we have wild spinach, um, squash, tepary beans, of course. Um, so I grew up with beans always, you know, that was, that's a uh, comfort food, tepary beans, any kind of bean. And what do you love to cook, Shannon? Beans. Beans are my favorite thing to cook. And uh, I think I'm pretty good at it, so. <laughs> I think you are too. <laughs> You've seen that and read about it. Uh, and hopefully you can do a food demo um, with us sometime. That'd be really great. Uh, Danielle? I was at the, actually attended the Southwest Foodways gathering 
in July in Ajo and got to eat a lot of beans. <laughs> and it was, I was like, how do you guys, you know, it was so dry. And, um, and it was the biggest conversation, right? Being next to the border and how the border affects both of our, our nations and our food systems um, was very interesting. So uh, in Blackfeet country, um, we are right at the foot of the Rockies and our territory goes all the way to Glacier Park, um, just for you to get a reference of like how cold it is here. Um, and we have a very short season. And so buffalo, wild game, um, moose, elk, deer, we have all of that good stuff here. Um, and then we have our food system from the plains, from the foothills, and from the mountains. And then have special areas within there, right? Along the streams is where we get all the peppermint and all of the soft rooted um, vegetables. And then we have lots of um, wild onion and wild carrot and wild potatoes and, um, my favorite thing is during this season is the berries. We have the ones that I've identified um, as 12 edible berries. And so um, yesterday I was picking lots of thimble berries uh, up in, in Glacier. And so also having that access to harvest in the, in the park um, allows us to be able to access those foods that we're not able to um, get in this lower elevation. And my favorite thing to cook is buffalo burgers. It sounds so delicious, Danielle. Um, and thank you for explaining um, some of these foods, but also just the territories and, and recognizing the resilience of our foods and the seeds that we have, the animals. Um, and for me, I'm here in the Southwest and here's um, one of our corn that we picked um, uh, several weeks ago. And so, you know, we, we look at the, the best um, corn and the kernels, you know, to be able to plant for next year, but also to seed save. And so it's just really precious as we talk about food and we talk about food as medicine, right? I know Shannon mentioned, you know, that um, for our families that are diabetic or, you know, who are suffering from different food related diseases, you know, for us, we, we always try to recommend, you know, as we see mom or dad as a diabetic, um, we don't just see them as diabetics. We are all diabetics with them. We eat together as diabetics, our food is healing. And through this pandemic, we've seen that, you know, with COVID, you know, to be able to provide healthy foods, to be able to provide our own foods and supplementation of nutrients, you know, that comes from our squash, beans, corn, buffalo, bison, all of these berries that you mentioned, the antioxidants, the, the nutrients, the vitamins that are just immense um, in these foods, you know, is really a blessing. But sometimes we may not have access to that. Um, and so the next question, you know, for you both, you know, what are some challenges that you have faced during the pandemic, but also how have you overcome those? We'll start with Danielle and then over to Shannon. Yeah, um, this is a great question. I always say um, we, <laughs> we, our food pantry, for example, um, had a 500% increase in participants and our food pantry was only six months old when the pandemic hit. And um, that's also at the same time as other programs were saying, I'm not taking new participants and, and people had jobs and we were that source. All of a sudden, everybody knew about us, a place where you don't have to bring your financials and feel interrogated to get food assistance. And so um, we, our challenge was keeping up with the demand um, and being able to serve our community and all these, uh, different ways through our through our programs and it also had great opportunities right uh, um we were able to start a new program that rooted out of covid and now do harvesting classes um but the challenge of um having a higher demand also meant like we were scramming for um money for funding uh, as a nonprofit, right having to fundraise for everything that you provide to your community and so um we were also just very fortunate and happy to see more um, funding opportunities coming during COVID, right? More people willing to help um, and uh, end up buying a, a mobile food pantry out of that COVID money. Um, so there was a lot of challenges, but through those growing pains um, came more opportunity for our community. Yeah, some of the challenges that we had was um staffing, um, finding people to come out and do the work. Uh, we did get, 
you know, we had to rely on our teaching staff and bus drivers and anyone that would come out and help us because the demand was so high for food during the pandemic. And we just needed people in the, um, to come help package food. And we stood out in the sun and delivered meals and got um, food boxes delivered here. And we just would hand out anything we could and the people were taking it. They needed it that much. And so, um, you know, we did what we could, but it was definitely um, a learning experience. It was definitely, I personally found it very um, humbling that I was able to provide to my community at that time. Um, and, you know, I mentioned before about, I wish I could write it down in a story because that's something I want to share with my grandchildren one day, you know, how food service, school food service helped take care of the community, you know, in this really hard time. And I just also would like to mention about, you know, we talk about COVID and how much it really came and just hurt, hurt the native community. And so I always come, come back to, it brings it back to nutrition, like how many community members might have been in a better place if they had eaten better, you know, because nutrition, um, having a healthy gut and all of that, you know, it just, it's actually breaks my heart to know that some of us, some of them could have been saved if, if only they had known to eat better. Thank you sisters for sharing that. And also the realities that we still face with this pandemic and the continuing realities. Um, the pandemic has really highlighted some of the inequities, disparities in our communities that already existed before the pandemic. Then the pandemic came and then, you know, all of these, you know, uh, challenges were um, highlighted, but also um, the challenges were addressed in some aspects and we're still advocating, right, you know, to address our food systems, to address access to clean water, to address, you know, how we're going to grow our food, you know, without, you know, the water that that is diminishing and also facing this drought in the Southwest, you know, all of these questions were, you know, trying to tackle one thing after, you know, the next, but also I think it's really beautiful how um, Indigenous um, communities have stepped up, you know, um, working you know, together um, in solidarity, um, as we've seen, you know, there's so much diversity in our communities, but yet, you know, um, Indian country has come together to be able to address some of these um, issues, but also to advocate for our indigenous food ways, for protecting that, defending it, and also promoting that. And I'm really fortunate to have you two on um, this topic talk today because you're doing community work, you know, in different aspects, but it's really important to give encouragement to our audience, to give encouragement to those that are listening, because it's not just medicine to our ears, medicine to our heart, medicine to our spirit, but also it's medicine going forward. It's medicine to how we, you know, create visions, but also carry those visions, the prophecies that have been given to us from our ancestors, from our elders, to be able to incorporate um, and hold pain and put pain to purpose, hold these solutions and strategies and implement that with community, not just on behalf of community, not just tribal leaders, not just elected officials, but also just, you know, working with the community members. It's really important that that intergenerational work is there. And so um, thank you for what you have shared. Um, we're going to go ahead and take some questions from the audience. Brian's going to come on. Um, we're going to share the space together um, and further navigate um, what people would like to inquire about, but also what they're asking and interested in. So Brian, you have some questions for us? Absolutely. First, I just want to thank all three of you for everything that you've shared today um, and all, all that you've done so far and all that you will do in the future to um, support nutrition, health, uh, embrace food um, that is important and, and right for your communities. And um, yeah, the one food in particular that is exciting folks in the chat are beans. Um, this is not a surprise. People love beans. It is, um, it is the, the time of the bean uh, both for Slow Food USA, which chose beans as our plant a seed kit for 2022. Um, but it's, yeah, um, a couple of folks were curious about some bean best practices. Um, and I wonder if you have any tips uh, before we kind of brought in the conversation to some um, some other um, harder hitting <laughs> topics. But um, any quick tips for cooking beans? Um, take your time. Don't rush them. Yeah, they, they, you just have to pay attention to them. Like, 
once you put them on, you put them in your pot and add just enough water to cover and then, but not too much water, otherwise they'll be watery, uh, watery. So just, and keep stirring them. Crock pots are good, but you still have to watch the water, but slow, taking your time, I guess, is don't rush. You can't rush good food, like my mom said. And just to uh, add to that, I really love how you say take your time because I think this is the conversation too from Chef Brian Yazi. He says, don't instapot your indigenous foods, right? We want to like throw it in there and like get it all done. And it takes six to eight hours. It takes overnight. It takes a couple of days, like the preparation, but also the relationship, right? When you do grow beans, when you do grow, grow the three sisters, the, the squash, the beans, the corn together, the pumpkins, the watermelon, like you start to understand, you know, where they've come from. And also you start to just have a relationship because you start to smell the beans when you're cooking it. You start to even like, you know, salivate because you know what you're going to be tasting. You start to strategize like, you know, what am I going to add? Am I going to add some chili peppers or, you know, am I going to add, you know, what kind of um, indigenous, you know, sea salt or, you know, um, what am I going to add as, you know, some vegetables in there or, you know, you start to think about all these different things so that even the experience in cooking it before we taste it's really important that's what we try to teach is the taste education you know what do we know we what do we prepare for on our palate but also you know in our planting but also you know thinking about biodiversity and learning about the many many beans out there the pulses you know the grains you know that can all be you know combined together um in a really beautiful um bowl like uh, shannon had explained um i'm not sure if, uh danielle has any bean experience um over to you sister no i just love my mom's lima beans but we definitely can't grow beans here um we have such high winds uh that whip off of the mountain um that our beans would get knocked down um but i tasted amazing beans every day we had beans uh at the at the um gathering in arizona in july and so i just really enjoyed um, trying different foods, right? Some of the Arizona people is their first time eating buffalo and some of the other people is first time eating mutton. And then um, for a lot of us too, it's just different ways of eating cactus and eating um, uh, the the beans. So um, I realized when I was down there, they're, they're definitely the star, right? And every tribe has a staff of life and their staff of life also happens to be related to their food. Sometimes it's salmon, sometimes it's buffalo and um, the three sisters in some area and then beans in areas. And it's also, it's amazing to learn about um, other tribes and realize just how healthy everybody's indigenous food system is. Um, staying on the topic of beans, but expanding it into um, availability costs, uh, thinking about our economy. Um, our friend Ian has a question for Shannon um, about the scarcity of tepary beans uh, for farmers um, and uh, that they're, they are scarce for a variety of reasons right now, um, like so many indigenous foods. Um, but how were you able to keep costs down um, under the tiny amount of money that the US government allows per student meal? Thankfully, the tribe um, helps us. Um, we get support from the tribe. Like if there's anything for special activities such as that, um, we we can invoice the tribe or the tribe will cover the costs. Um, so I did have noticed that temporary beans seem to have really increased in price as with everything else, but um, they're still out there, but they're just a little more costly. But uh, my family's been really stocking up because of because of that. Absolutely. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. And um, it's it's great that you're able to get some of that support to offset rising costs, uh, lower availability scarcity. Um, you know, Blake um, asked a question that I think is really interesting about um, understanding our ethnobotanical histories in our regions, right? A lot, a lot of people have been um, a lot of a lot of history and information has been suppressed intentionally from us. Uh, because of colonization, because of racism. And I'm wondering if any of you have tips or ideas on how we can um, reconnect with our um, with the history of the food of the people of our land um, so that we can better um, preserve, restore, and um, be in better community with, um, with, our, with our ancestors, with our land, and, and with the people who live here and have lived here. For me, um, we've been I've been talking a lot to our elders, um, my mom, my aunties, 
um, because they're the ones that hold those, those stories. Um, all that knowledge is with them. And so I've been really trying to talk with them and um, it should be, you know, once I talk with them, I'm going to be writing things down. Our, also, our tribal library does a lot of document documenting such things like that. Um, but that's the best way I know is just to talk to those that know. You know, there's it's the elders, it's our aunts, our uncles, even fa um, some families that are more traditional, the younger people have those stories. So we just need to ask. Yeah, I agree. I, it's really from community, right? Um, going to conferences is great, but are you are you in your community, right? Um, are you teaching all that information and, and sharing all of that just within um, your community? Because once we start sharing, they start sharing. Um, and that's been the experience with the tea gardens um, that we introduced these seven teas into these tea gardens, but then that sparks that tea gardener to go ask her mom and her grandma which plants she used to collect and where she used to collect them and why she collected them. And, and then it, it then roots them back to, oh, my family was harvesters too. And that's the point, right? We were all harvesters. Um, and, and if we can make that connection um, and we can show up to community events and learn from each other um, and, and host events and collaborate with other partnerships, right? Being a nonprofit, we, we realized how much other people stay siloed. Um, within their government. Um, and we invite everybody to the table. So that means Fast Blackfeet's bringing everybody together or helping people collaborate better, but um, for the betterment of our entire community. And just to comment, um, you know, with my sisters, it's really important. Now is the UNESCO's dec decade of indigenous languages from this year, 2022 to 2032. And looking at our indigenous languages, you know, I, I know it's maybe not available to everyone, but we are all indigenous from somewhere and learning, you know, with the communities um, and getting to know, you know, who is in your community, learning the language, learning, you know, some of these aspects that we cannot even speak in English in this foreign language, English, right? That some of the, the things that we say, some of the prayers, some of the things that our mothers and grandmothers, especially in my matriarchal society, you know, it's really important that, you know, the, the matrilineal um, heritage is passed forward. And so some things are spoken in a way, in a manner, you know, that carries um, significance, but also spiritual significance, and also um, just the way of knowing, you know, that our spiritual being um, receives these different sayings and um, and prophecies, but also the language that is spoken in a manner, you know, that can't be taken any other way. Um, and so it's really important as we acknowledge that too, you know, how we speak to each other and also how we implement that in our programs to be able to know that we also have to advocate for indigenous languages, especially regarding our food systems, because that's where it all started together, you know, with them, they speak to us, you know, for example, um, the way the water makes the noise, um, talk, you know, if we keep hearing, you know, the water running, um, it, it actually speaks to us and, it, and it's to, to. And so that's how we say it um, in Diné. And so as we listen to how they speak to us, they're also speaking to us the language that we need to know that they're speaking. And so it's really important as we, you know, talk about how to connect and also to be aware of these things. Back to you, Brian. 100%. Thank you. No, I, I, yeah, it is. It's so cyclical, and everything is so interconnected. And I, I, I want to actually shift to two um, interconnected and slightly different questions that both Lily and um, Claire have asked. So um, I want to kind of think about this from like a macro and a micro perspective of um, thinking first about Lily's question, which is what types of resources are most needed in your communities to heal food relationships? Thinking about that um, on the ground, people to people, um, like what, what, are, what, is, what are you yearning for to heal those food relationships? I think ours is telling the truth. Um, sometimes we sugarcoat it, right? Or sometimes we say that was in the past or that wasn't my generation. Um, and so we just tell the truth and, and, um, and give it the way it is, right? Like tell it the way it is, the way it actually happened. Don't try to not hurt anybody's feelings. Um, but also, uh, 
being able to heal together, right? It also means having access to those foods, um, having access to be able to harv harvest bison um, and access to that park to be able to get those specific foods and medicines. Um, and so I think in other communities, I've experienced other tribes who do not have the access. They don't have the, the land mass or a reservation in that, in that aspect. So being able to find those ways of connecting back to those foods. Um, and as Denisa said, uh, there are some of the names of our foods describe those foods and how to prepare those foods. There are secrets of those foods, the same with our medicine, different medicines that need to be activated with your saliva, different medicines that need to be harvested before or after bloom. Those are, those are not always in books in Western science, right? Um, so being able to um, take that information and know that traditional ecological knowledge is, is, is um, indigenous ways and food ways. And that's a great way of healing is um, connecting back and learning about those. Um, I think for us here in Salt River, it's really difficult to for people to understand how how the benefits of our ancestral foods, I I really like how Danielle brought that point up, but um, it's very difficult for them to see the benefits and to understand how the foods, all this processed foods that they're eating, is not helping them at all um, because we're so close to it. You know, the city is just right here, and it's easier just to run to the store and get all of that than you know, cook something or, you know, grow something. It's really, and I think that is our biggest challenge is trying to give them that knowledge and have them understand that what you're eating today is going to affect you tomorrow. And you want to eat what's best for you right now, because you, you want to be healthy, you know, for your family, for yourself. Um, so for me, that's the biggest challenge. Um, I'm 50, 54 years old this year. And I can honestly say this has been a learning process for me. And it's just been within the last eight years that I started learning all of this for myself. So, you know, there's younger people out there that haven't got to that point yet. You know, when we're young, we think we're going to live forever. It doesn't matter what we eat. But, you know, as we grow older, we start to learn. And so that's what I'm trying to do is get them to learn when they're younger so they don't have to go through all of the challenges, health challenges that we all go through, you know, but for me, yeah, it's that, it's just getting that knowledge out there. And, and just to add on to what my sisters have shared, it's building relationships, you know, getting to know, you know, who's in your community, whether you're an urban um, area or whether you're in a rural area, getting to know people. It's all about building relationships like the three sisters, you know, we get to know, you know, what, you know, one another, you know, what we do, you know, for our work, what our passions are, what our challenges are, and also knowing, you know, how do we move forward together because we're all impacted by these, you know, different challenges in the world, you know, our brothers and sisters that, you know, are suffering also in Kenya from the drought, you know, in Ethiopia, you know, we can see, you know, the challenges, we can see indigenous peoples worldwide, you know, affected by the things that we're affected by. And so it's really important as we connect, we start to learn all of the intersectionalities that bring us together, that make us whole, that make us stronger together. And so it's really important to know, you know, to reach out and, and not be afraid. I wear this pin right here. It says, be brave. Like when you're telling yourself like, oh, I can't do that. Or, you know, I, I'm, I'm too scared. And, you know, we can't, you know, we just have the courage, you know, to have the ability, make some time and just like push something else aside and say, I am going to make this time, you know, intentional time to be able to connect with this person or just have, you know, some tea or snack time over zoom with somebody like make a date you know make something you know to be able to learn and also exchange and have that valuable time together and know you know it's about relationship building and when we get there we start to understand like oh I understand their language I'm understanding the culture I'm understanding you know the the relationships between the life ways and the food ways it's really important it all comes down to relationship building and um in the book um 
Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the U.S. This is our book that came out maybe two years ago. Um, Chef um, Nephi Craig says, you know, it's about returning to cultural pride. And so, you know, it's it's really important if you want to get to know more, it's also about literacy. It's also about reading all of these books, reading the narratives from Indigenous peoples, you know, that have written and also speak on behalf of their cultures and their food ways. So really important. I did put the link up for the recipes from Turtle Island um, that you can also download load um, for your reference. Um, so there's lots of different things and ways that we can learn from one another, but also just be there for one another in this time. That's great. And I shared the link to the, um, to the book as well in the chat, um, Indigenous Food Sovereignty in the U.S. Um, as we look to the, um, the last couple of minutes of our time together, which is so hard to say, because uh, I, would, I would love to just spend the rest of the day with you all. Um, Zooming out from the micro to the macro and thinking about being brave, like you just said, Denisa, what are what is maybe one thing at maybe a systemic or policy level that folks who are in the room with us right now can do um, to really like support the work that the three of you are doing and support this food healing um, on kind of like a bigger level? So this is our call to action. Um. Um, <clears throat> call to action. Since I'm in the school, um, I just support from the, we do get a lot of support from our administration, but like smaller support in the classroom, you know, just having teachers support um, what we do and um, sharing we you know when we put stuff out to share it with the students, um, you know, this ingredient is a bean and it's grown, grown here in the community. Um, and then on a bigger picture is just um, support from the community, you know, and they, they do offer support and I'm sure they would if they were more involved, um, you know, but it's just, you know, and that kind of lies on me also like getting it out there to tell them this is what we're doing. How can you help us, you know, and um, in what ways are you willing to support us? And yeah. <laughs> I would say um, we're nonprofit, so uh, we don't exactly have a government uh, uh, above us, but what is most important is that we let those entities know what we're doing. Um, that we are going to the tribal council and letting them know um, what our efforts are, making sure that the tribe supports what we are doing, even though we're not a tribal program. And, and because helping those um, entities also realize the funding opportunities, right? We have access to funding opportunities that the tribe is not, doesn't have access to or the school doesn't have access to. But if we partner and we collaborate, we can make that opportunity happen. Sometimes mo the the main thing is under they're underfunded, right? Different programs are underfunded, so they can't do certain services. But if they're able to partner with organize local nonprofits, they could they could get the help um, and the funding, and also be able to bring um, other entities in, right? We can't do everything on our own, and I think that's a big thing in um, Indian country is how can we all together have a mission in the end. Um, and I think really making sure that you're part of those um, conversations. When we did our food sovereignty assessment here, and then we did our food sovereignty strategic planning, Fast Blackfeet was there um, so that we could make sure that we were going to be helping in one of those pillars, right? That we weren't just on the side. Um, so I think ours is just communicating with those, um, presenting to school boards, letting them know what we're doing, how many children we're serving through our programs. Uh, just for that support aspect, but also that mutual respect of transparency. This is what we're doing. Can you tell us what you're doing? Um, so that so that we better serve. Yeah, just to add on to that, um, I think some other advocacy areas is continuing to advocate, you know, being um, able to share, you know, this recording, the visibility, increasing that, you know, of the exposure of 
this work because as we look at the White House initiative on the Conference of Nutrition and Hunger that's coming up, I mean, the government has not had this conference over 50 years. You know, how are we advocating on behalf of Indigenous people regarding that? Also, the White House initiative on implementing traditional ecological knowledge, you know, into our frameworks um, is really important to advocate. And then we also need to reactivate the support for the Native American Seeds Protection Act that's been sitting, you know, at Congress. And, you know, how do we support that as well to be able to protect our seeds. Um, it's really important, but also on the international level, getting folks involved, you know, in some of these international arenas, because we all need to, you know, stand together on a global platform and to be able to do that as we look forward to the Terra Madre event that's coming up in a couple of weeks. You know, those are some of the hard discussions that we're going to have, but also we will come back, you know, with, with greater strategies and, and ways to implement, you know, the way that we do things together, the way that we partner and collaborate together is really critical because even in that as as organizers um our climate change is to organize better and and i think you know if we can have more platforms about helping one another to do that it is really important um, as we look at the healing frameworks and strategies that we need to implement thank you everyone and remember that healthy food is life um we say that and so um thank you everyone for being here we appreciate every one of you and hope we can connect soon over to you, Brian. Thank you. I just want to thank um, all three of you, Denisa Livingston, Danielle Antelope comes in singing, uh, Shannon Reyna um, for being here, for teaching us, for uh, yeah, being um, yeah, being sisters with one another and sharing um, a lot of really great insights with us. Um, I want to echo Denise's thanks to uh, Mara Welton and Ian McFall for helping get, it, get this conversation going. Um, I want to thank everyone in the room. Um, this is a, actually our highest attended Slow Food Live event in the last year. Um, and so um, I just I appreciate you all being present um, with these amazing leaders. Um, if you want to watch uh, previous uh, Slow Food Live sessions, please check out um, our website, slowfoodusa.org forward slash slow food live. Uh, and thanks for your time and your energy. And um, let's all go forth together slowly but surely. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.